Greetings, and a good day to each of you. Vaccines have been one of the largest contributions to public health for at least a century by now, and saved countless millions of lives. Today, I will present to you a novel strategy for the attenuation of viruses at the example of polio virus, as well as delve into the topic of the digitalization and availability of pathogen genomes and its potential implications in research. In the introduction, I will outline the two papers I've received as main sources. Quickly recap the polio virus and the most severe form of disease it can cause, poliomyelitis, as well as the history of the fight against it. Next, I will give a brief overview over common methods of developing vaccines and how they reach their goal. And lastly, go into detail about the host side of the host pathogen interaction. After that, I will move over to the experiments and methods used to answer the research questions of my two papers. For the first paper, these will be the synthesis of a virus genome as well as production and assembly of wild-type infectious virus particles in a cell-free system. The second will then modify this genome in subtle ways, compare the resulting differences, and measure the tangible effects in a transgenic mouse model system of polio infection. In the discussion, I will summarize the results of the experiments and explain to what extent the researchers were able to fulfill their research targets. I will also delve deeper into the background implications of the first paper and explain the public reaction it caused. Lastly, I will conclude the presentation with a short summary of all the insights we'll have gained by then and my take-home message. Now for the papers. One was written by Eckerd Wimmer, a renowned chemist and virologist who's best known for the complete synthesis of the polio virus in absence of the cellular environment in 2002. He was born shortly before the Second World War but is still alive and well today and involved in research. The second paper is a report by a group of scientists, published in 2008, and describes a novel method of virus attenuation, capable of changing its fitness and speed of replication in the host without making a single change to the viral proteins or restricting the range of antigens presented, while severely limiting the chance of reversion. It was written by James Coleman and a few other authors, among those Eckerd Wimmer as well, but Coleman is designated as the main author. And in the time since, he has also become co-founder of a new company which aims to create vaccines using the techniques discussed in his paper. Now that we've learned a bit more about the authors, I want to recap the infectious agent they have been dealing with in their papers, the polio virus. It belonged to the family of Picornaviridae. It's a rather small virus, even compared to other viruses, with a diameter of 30 nanometers. Accordingly, its genome also can be too large to still fit inside the capsid. It's a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome of about 7.2 to 8.5 kilobases. The viroid itself is formed as an icosahedron, with 60 protomers in total on the outer surface, consisting of the viral proteins VP1, VP2 and VP3, and the additional VP4 on the inside of the protein coat. The viral genome has a VPG and IRIS site for initiation of translation, a poly-A tail, can be directly translated or transcribed, and encodes a single polyprotein, which is processed into three precursor parts, P1, P2, and P3, by a viral protease. P1 contains the structural proteins, P2 and P3 the viral RNA polymerase and further proteins that modify the host cell behavior. In the second paper, the authors only modified the sequence of the P1 part. As a pathogenic viral agent, polio is an enterovirus, which may enter through the mucosa of the intestine and invade the nervous system. While most infections are mild or inapparent, about 0.5% of infections eventually lead to a permanent paralysis, which may spread further, and 5 to 10% of those with poliomyelitis eventually die due to asphyxiation. There is no treatment for polio. However, there are two vaccines which have been in widespread use for decades, the inactivated polio vaccine and the oral polio vaccine which contains live virus that has been attenuated. There are three serotypes of polio, and both vaccines are trivalent and protect against poliomyelitis from any of the three, since there are effective vaccination options and the disease occurs in most regions of the world, mostly affecting young children. Polio has been considered for eradication from the human population. One of the first major steps towards this goal were severe polio epidemics in the USA in the 1940s which accelerated research and eventually led to the invention of IPV in 1955 and OPV in 1963. Two vaccines which were quickly and widely applied in the USA and other developed countries and led to a sharp decrease in cases. Before the vaccination, there were outbreaks at regular intervals. Afterwards, the cases have quickly approached zero, and since 1979, the USA have been entirely free of indigenous polio. It took a bit longer in developing countries to recognize cases of paralysis as being caused by polio. 
After surveys in the 1970s, the prevalence of polio in other areas of the world was recognized, and efforts were made to prevent it there as well through vaccinations. One organization which has supported this goal is called Rotary International, a nonprofit organization, which has begun in 1979 by vaccinating 6 million children in the Philippines and, together with the World Health Organization, launched the Global Polio Eradication Initiative in 1988. By then, there were still cases in 125 countries all over the world. By 1994, polio had been eradicated from the entire Americas. By 2000, 550 million children, or 10% of the entire world population, had been immunized, and the entire Western Pacific region, from Australia to China, was considered free of polio. Finally, by 2012, India had passed one year without a single recorded case of polio. Once three years had passed, it received the official certificate by the WHO, and from then on, the entire Southeast Asian region was considered free of polio. Also, the last case of polio caused by the serotype 2 has been recorded in 1999, and of type 3 in 2012. They were considered eradicated in 2015 and 2019 respectively. In total, 2.5 billion children have been vaccinated with OPV so far, and since 1988, worldwide cases of polio have been reduced by 99%. Today, there are only three countries left with endemic cases of polio, Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Pakistan. However, no endemic cases doesn't mean that there are no cases of polio with another origin. OPV is a live virus, which means it reproduces. It can make errors during replication, gain mutations, and revert to a more neurovirulent form. Here we can see the number of times reversed poliovirus has been detected since 2000. This reversion mostly occurs to the serotype 2, and as a reaction, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative has stopped to include the serotype in polio vaccines in 2016. In total, there have been 24 outbreaks of vaccine-derived polio, with 760 cases my second research paper aims to generate a novel form of attenuation which would prevent this reversion, or at least make it far more unlikely than with OPV. Which is why I'll now give a brief overview over the different kinds of vaccines there are so far, so that we can compare them to the method used in the paper later. To create protective and lasting immunity, the body's adaptive immune system needs to be trained. Which means antigens of the pathogen in question must somehow make their way into the body in sufficient quantity without overwhelming the body or causing too strong immune reaction. Striking this balance requires some fine-tuning. The goal of finding a good vaccine can, for example, be reached through organisms that replicate in the body on their own, but not cause disease, or only mild symptoms. Examples include the attenuated oral polio vaccine, or organisms which either share important immunogenic epitopes, like cowpox as a vaccine against smallpox, or none. Pathogenic viruses or bacteria that have been modified to express specific proteins, as a vector organism. As we've seen, these may be associated with the risk of reversion or cause problems in immunodeficient members of society. Another option is the injection of substances that present the antigen but are entirely incapable of replication, like chemically killed or fixated bacteria or viruses, or their protein subunits or toxins. Often these are combined with adjuvants to stimulate the strong immune response necessary for the generation of memory cells and may have side effects. A more recent invention are DNA or RNA vaccines, as nucleic acids, they are stable over long time and at room temperature when stored correctly, and also quick and easy to manufacture. However, even though they have shown success in trials, there currently are no licensed vaccines using this technique. Every known de novo protein synthesis in biological organisms starts at a ribosome, with messenger RNA as a template, and transfer RNA, which sequentially shuttles matching amino acids to the ribosome where the polymerization of the peptide is catalyzed, and the chain extends by one with each tRNA. Since each codon consists of three bases, and there are four possible bases for each spot, there can be four to the power of three, or 64, possible triplet codons. However, not every organism uses every possible triplet in its repertoire, and since there are only 23 amino acids at maximum, the triplet code is degenerated. This means multiple triplets can encode for the same amino acid. Most organisms have 28 to 61 different kinds of tRNA. Humans fall into the middle of that span with 45 unique codons. These differences mean that not every organism has the same relative percentage of each kind of tRNA in their cytoplasm. For example, in humans, the alanine codon GCC is used four times as often as GCG. Since there is no active transport of specific tRNA to the active ribosome, 
One factor of speed of translation is the chance of the right tRNA meeting the ribosome at the right moment. This chance depends on the fractions of different tRNAs found in the organism and the triplet codons found on the mRNA. This means that for optimal efficiency, both have to be matched. This results in the codon usage bias. In industrial bioreactors, optimizing the codon usage is commonly performed to achieve maximal efficiency of recombinant protein expression. In this graphic, we can see that different species may prefer different codons and are biased in that way. Some naturally occurring genes also use different codons this way to regulate their expression without the need of further regulatory proteins or sequences. Aside from the codon bias, there's another level of complexity, the codon pair bias. It describes the influence of neighboring codons on the translation efficiency and adds another layer of regulation. A theory for the mechanism is as follows. If a codon triplet and the next triplet in line allow for the same tRNA to bind, the tRNA can be reused more quickly after recycling. The difference in translational speed also has an effect on the genetics. For example, in humans, for the triplet code of the amino acid sequence alanine glutamic acid, the codons GCA, GAG occur seven times as often as GCC, GAA, even though they encode the exact same amino acids. Now that we know the basis of the pathogen and the underlying principles, we can examine the more specific contents of the papers. I will begin with the first paper and the synthesis of the poliovirus in vitro. To synthesize the virus, the nucleotide sequence of its genome must be available first. It had been sequenced earlier, in 1981, by another research group, and the author simply procured a digital copy. At the time of the experiment, the synthesis of the 7.5 kilo bases of RNA, however, would have been very difficult, so the authors ordered smaller double-stranded complementary DNA fragments via mail instead and enzymatically ligated them to create the viral RNA. They then used the T7 RNA transcriptase and were able to generate the whole RNA genome of the virus. They could have simply transfected human cells with the virus RNA, but instead, they chose a cell-free environment to overthrow one of the axioms of biology, that the proliferation of viruses would always require a functional cell. They produced the cell-free medium from a lysate of human HeLa cells. After a filtering step, most cellular contents, including the nucleus, mitochondria and other cellular organelles were removed so that little more than basic proteins and chemical compounds remained. Nonetheless, when the viral RNA was added to the solution, they were able to produce viral proteins as well as replicate the viral genome to produce even more virus. And once a threshold was reached, poliovirus particles spontaneously assembled to confirm that they had actually produced an infectious, replication-competent virus. They then performed a plaque assay on HeLa cells with the wild-type poliovirus and the de novo synthesized virus and found that they behaved similarly. To sum up, the research team had taken a digital viral genome from the public domain, let it be synthesized from an external company in fragments, joined these fragments themselves, and then created infectious, viable poliovirus in a cell lysate mixture without ever needing a sample of wild poliovirus. To be fair, this was not the first time any of the methods had been applied, but their combination, and the result, caused many discussions and public attention when the original paper was published in 2002. More on that later in the discussion part. Before that, I will present the contents of my second source paper, where the authors make use of a publicly available virus sequence in another way. First, they created a computer algorithm to assist their efforts. This program is capable of exchanging codons while keeping the original amino acid sequence and considers the codon bias as well as the codon pair bias and even the folding free energy of the RNA strand. This way, a codon pair bias score can be assigned to any genetic sequence, and genes can be recoded to have a lower or even a higher CPB score than the wild type. For the experiments, a CPB score of zero meant approximate equivalence to normal human genes. The researchers created two new polioviruses called PVMIN and PVMAX, which had a lower or higher CPB score respectively. To have a more gradual attenuation, they subcloned parts of the modified P1 region of PVMIN into wild-type virus and created engineered virus with a lesser degree of genetic attenuation. As you can see, the variants fall into different ranges of CPB scores, with PVMIN having the most negative value, then followed by the X, Y, and Z subclones. In total, PVMIN contained 631 synonymous mutations and PVMAX 566 mutations. However, so far, these have only been unconfirmed calculations. To determine to what degree the genetic modification altered the translation efficiency, they transfected HeLa R19 cells with the viral RNAs and observed the cytopathic effect and plaque formation. 
as well as measuring the titer in plaque forming units and in total virus particles per plaque. To measure the number of viral particles, they measured the optical absorption of the sample. And here are the results. First, they compared PV min and PV max with the wild type and found that PV max produced 90% of the wild type cytopathic effect 24 hours after transfection in HeLa R19 cells and created plaques of comparable size. So it was very similar to wild polio, while PV min was unable to produce any visible cytopathic effect even after 96 hours. PV min also did not result in any viable virus in the supernatin of transfected cells. The subclones X and Y were each mildly attenuated, and when combined into XY, strongly attenuated, subclone Z was about as attenuated as XY. PV min YZ, however, did not yield any viable virus. As conclusion, the authors assumed that the non-viability of the original PV min variant was caused by the sum of defects in the individual subportions of the P1 sequence as an emergent phenomenon and not any single mutation on their own. And because many hundreds of individual mutations contributed, reversion should also be much harder. Next, they further quantified the degree of attenuation by measuring the plaque forming units produced after transfection and the number of virus particles per PFU. They found that all variants underwent exponential growth and ended in a plateau phase. However, the absolute number of PFUs varied by a factor of up to 1000. Note the exponential y-axis. This largest difference was observed between wild type and variant Z. When they compared the absolute number of viral particles produced, they found that variant XY or Z only produced about 10 times less virus than the wild type, and the number of particles per PFU was 100 times smaller. Together, the attenuation of 10 and 100 led to a total attenuation by a factor of 1000. In effect, the wild type required about 137 particles to form a plaque, the strongly attenuated constructs about 13,500. The attenuation can be mostly attributed to a reduced specific infectivity. They also compared the heat stability of the different variants as a measure of defects in the capsids and found no differences. To further examine the mechanism of attenuation, they then created a reporter system for the translational efficiency of the virus. For this purpose, they further modified the PV variants by introducing two reporter genes, in this case two different luciferase proteins called R-LUC and F-LUC, which produce two distinguishable signals. The R-LUC protein is part of the first cistern which is controlled by an IRIS promoter at the start of the mRNA, and F-LUC is included as a fusion protein in the P1 part, so that its transcription is directly linked to the expression of the modified segments. By comparing the F-LUC and R-LUC signal, they could normalize compare the translational efficiency of the P1 region versus the overall polio mRNA translation. By the results, we can see that the translations differs quite a bit between the variants and follows a similar trend as the previously observed differences in plaque formation or virus viability. Again, PV-min is at the lowest rank, followed by Z, XY, the wild type, and the optimized PV-max. This means that the attenuation can probably be explained by the change in translation efficiency. Lastly, they performed an experiment to check whether the effects observed in vitro were also applicable in an in vivo infection model. They administered 10 to the power of 8 virus particles per animal to transgenic mice expressing CD155, the human receptor necessary for polio infection. To test the advanced form of polio pathogenesis, they injected the virus directly into the central nervous system to test the immunogenicity they chose intraperitoneal injection. These are the results of the intracerebral injection. The number of particles are comparable between all variants, with max being even lower than XY. However, the PFUs are farther in between, and the PLD50 per particle, that is the dose needed for paralysis in 50% of mice, even more so, showing a difference of roughly 10 to the power of 3, or 1000. Just as the earlier results of attenuation in tissue culture. In the second experiment, after injecting the X, Y, or Z variant three times into the perineum, they challenged mice with an otherwise lethal dose of wild-type polio and observed no fatalities or cases of paralysis, thereby confirming the immunizing effect of the attenuated polio variant. Now I will move over to the discussion part, where I collect the results and implications of the papers and also talk a bit more about the first one, but before that, I'll summarize the results of the experiments on one slide. We have seen that. A genome in the form of digital data can be synthesized. This genome can then be replicated and translated without the need for a living organism or cell culture. A known genome can be modified in computer-assisted design to fine-tune the translation efficiency based on the host cell code on bias. Virus genes modified this way can still be translated and yield infectious virus particles with wild-type proteins. 
Lastly, this attenuated virus can spread in a mouse model of infection and provides effective immune memory against wild-type polio. In theory, the same technique can be applied to any virus and may lead to new or improved vaccines in the future. And now for some of the results that touch more upon society than biology. When the original paper on the synthesis of polio virus was published, there was a bit of a public outcry and criticism from multiple sources, including other scientists and politicians. Because, after all, anyone who might read the paper and follow its methods might create a dangerous virus that has led to great suffering, and all they would need is the sequence shown here, and a bit of biochemical know-how. And not only polio, the principle is applicable to any virus, in theory, even those considered extinct or eradicated. Some even went so far as to call the previous polio eradication, or any kind of virus eradication, pointless, since they might be easily reintroduced at any time through artificial means. That's what I mean by the immortal pathogen. After all, there will always be a digital copy around of anything once it has been uploaded to the internet. Others claimed the work should have never been published, since it could serve as a blueprint for future bioterrorist attacks, and thus the paper would be a matter of national security. When looking at the polarized public opinion, it's also important to consider the context. After the terrorist attacks on 9-11, a year before the publishing of the paper, people were primed to fear for their safety and terrorism at the forefront of their mind. Another important factor was that the editors of the magazine forced the authors to cut out a part on the ethical and societal implications and shorten their text. This way, it was easier to, to twist the story into whichever way one wanted. From reading the paper, two big questions came to my mind. The first is, when is society ready for science? Because by itself, the methods were nothing new. Polio had been sequenced and its genome published many years earlier. The synthesis of DNA or expression of protein was also nothing new. Eckerd Wimmer did something groundbreaking, but he did it by combining known techniques in a new way. And if it was not for him and his research team, another would have probably attempted something similar sooner or later. If it had not been polio, but another, largely unknown virus, most may have never heard about it, even though the implications would have been just the same. And I'm sure we all have seen similar cases, last but not least during the COVID pandemic, where people without a scientific background blow research results or other theories wildly out of proportion, simply because they lack the proper education to understand the background. On the other hand, I think it would be wrong to keep results such as these a secret, since that would only seed distrust and further widen the gap in knowledge. Connected to this, my second question, how open should science be? Not just when sharing results with the public, but also among researchers and across countries and nations. It is true that a paper like my first time might make it easier for potential bioterrorists to cause havoc, or at least lower the entry barrier a bit. On the flip side, a small chance always remains, and what better way to prepare than share the basis of knowledge openly, let anyone who wants to work on it and develop or improve available treatments and preventions. And due to the serendipity in drug design, the research may also help against another unforeseen disease one day. Personally I think there's no bad knowledge, only bad actions and that knowledge should be shared as openly as possible, to promote education as well as constant development and critical reconsideration of what has already been collected. There may be risks involved, but I believe that the positives outweigh the drawbacks. As we have seen in the second paper, having the genome data accessible can also lead to some very useful real-world use cases. And this concludes my presentation. The only thing left is the take-home message. We have seen that. Life virus can be reconstructed from digital genome data. Even without live cells, the code on pair bias of genes can be modified to accelerate or decelerate their translation into protein. Code on pair attenuation influences the replication and translation of virus in cell culture and mouse model and may be used to immunize against the wild type virus. That has been my presentation, and here are my sources. Thank you for listening.